Hi, David here to demonstrate proofs of Kepler's second and third laws. Before we demonstrate the proof of the second law, it's useful to establish a few properties of the motion of the planet. First, its position is given by r, and its velocity given by v, which is equivalent to the derivative of the position. Similarly, the acceleration is equivalent to the derivative of the velocity, or the second derivative of the position. It's useful in this proof to describe the position in polar coordinates. That is, the, the vector r equals r cos theta in the i hat direction plus r sine theta in the j hat direction. Now these directions can be seen in the coordinate axis, the i hat direction being along the x axis, the j hat direction being along the y axis, and the direction along the z-axis is known as k-hat. Now, from the first law, we know that the vector h is equivalent to the position vector cross the velocity vector. And before we take this cross product, we'll have to find v in terms of polar coordinates. As we said earlier, v is equal to r primed, so the derivative of r will be dr by dt cos theta minus r sine theta d theta by dt in the i direction plus dr by dt sine theta plus r cos theta d theta by dt in the j hat direction. These dr by dt's and d theta by dt's come as a result of the radius being dependent on the time and the angle being dependent on the time. Now once this cross product is taken, you'll see that these two, this term here and this term here will end up cancelling out, and we will be left with h being equal to r cross v, which is equivalent to r squared cos squared theta d theta by dt, plus r squared sine squared theta d theta by dt. And with a quick factoring out, we're left with r squared d theta by dt times cos squared theta plus sine squared theta, which we know to be equal to 1. And we're left with, oh, that's theta, r squared d theta by dt is equal to the vector h. And as we had earlier, the... Um, the two directions we were dealing with were the i-hat and j-hat direction, and when those two are crossed, we have the i and the j-hat. When those two, the cross product of those are taken, you're left with the k-hat direction. So this h vector here is therefore in the k-hat direction. Now, in this next step, we will show that the magnitude of the vector h is equivalent to the magnitude of the vector r squared times d theta by dt. Now, as we had earlier, r is equal to r cos theta in the i direction plus r sine theta in the j direction. And the magnitude of this vector will be equal to the square root of the first term in the vector plus the square of the second term in the vector, and this will come out to exactly r. And similarly with h, we have it equal to r squared d theta by dt in the k hat direction, which means that it is zero in the i hat and j hat direction, so its magnitude will be given by the square root of essentially 0 squared plus 0 squared plus r squared d theta by dt squared, which comes out to exactly h. So then by this we can deduce that oops, we can deduce that the magnitude of h is equal to the magnitude of r squared times d theta by dt as r is equal to the magnitude and h is also. 
Now, the point of this proof is to show that the area swept out by a line joining the sun to a planet is equivalent at all time intervals, equivalent time intervals. And to do this, we'll need an expression for the area. And from previous lessons, we know that the area of a sector of a circle is equal to the integral from a to b of one-half r squared d theta. Now, this integral is in terms of d theta, but we need it in terms of dt. And we can do that with a quick substitution. We see here that from the equation, or the expression we derived earlier, that r squared d theta is equal to h d t. And we have an r squared d theta here, so we can sub that right in. And this gives us that the area is equal to the integral from a to b of one half h d t. Now, uh, as we had shown earlier, the h is a constant, as is one half, so they can be brought outside of the integral. And that gives one half h, the integral from a to b, of dt. Now, we're integrating with respect to time, so our bounds should be, in terms of time, on the interval t naught to t. So this can be rewritten as one half h, the integral t naught to t of dt. Now we can just evaluate this integral, and we're left with one half t minus t naught equal to a. So for equivalent time intervals, we know that the area will be constant as h and one half are constant. Therefore, Kepler's second law is proven. Starting back at our area integral in terms of dt and h, we will demonstrate the Kepler's third law, which states that the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis, which is, in terms of ellipses, this axis here. Now, to do this, we will differentiate both sides, so we're left with dA with respect to t. dA by b dt is equal to one-half h and we can rearrange this to show that dA is equal to one-half h d, oops, dt. So this says that a small area is equal to one-half h times a small change in time. Now if we want the whole area of a revolution, so from here all the way around to here, this whole area, we'll call that a. The time for that to happen is the is a one period or t. So this can be written rewritten as a is equal to one half h t. And from previous lessons we know that the area of an ellipse is equal to pi times the length of the semi-major axis times the length of the semi-minor axis. And now this will be equal to one half h t. Rearranging for the period, we are given two pi a, B over H. Now from the proof of Kepler's first law, we were given that E, the eccentricity, eccentricity is equal to C, a constant, over the universal gravitational constant times the mass of the Sun, and D is equal to H squared over C. So Easy cancellation here, as can be C H squared over G M is equal to E D. Now on page 663 of Stuart, two equations can be seen, one of which shows that A squared equals E squared D squared over 1 minus E squared squared, and B squared equals E squared d squared over 1 minus e squared. Now if we square root this whole thing here, so take the square root of both sides, we're left with a is equal to e d over 1 minus e squared. And if we divide both, if we divide b squared by a, we are left with, we'll divide b squared by a, that is equal to e squared d squared over 1 minus e squared all over ed over 
1 minus e squared. These cancel, and we are left with e d, which, as we shown above, is also equal to h squared over g m. So here we have the two equations we've just derived, and we'd like to combine them now. So first we're going to take the square of the period equation, square both sides. So we're left with t squared equals 4 pi squared a squared b squared over h squared. And we see we have an h squared in this equation and this equation. So we'd like to isolate for h squared here, which will be equal to gm b squared over a. And now we're going to sub this in for this h squared here. And we will be left with 4 pi squared a squared b squared all over gm b squared over a. And once we cancel the b squareds and multiply the a through, we are left with 4 pi squared a cubed over gm. And this is equal to the period squared. And here we can see that the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. And Kepler's third law is proven. Thank you.